here. And we were by the, um, we called ourselves the Abington Mass Against Mandates. And now we are South Shore Grassroots Alliance. Uh, we are now part of a bigger group, a bigger alliance. Um, we're part of Hanover, we're part of MAFA, we're trying to get part of Moms for Liberty, um, Rockland, South Shore Go Tech, Brockton. So we pulled some other towns in, and if any other any other people or parents, anybody uh, from other towns would like to be a part of this. We do have a Facebook page, we have a Telegram, we have a website. Um, it is all South Shore Grassroots Alliance. So I want to welcome you all tonight. Thank you for coming. We have an excellent lineup of speakers. Um, we have a couple of politicians in between that would like to speak and uh, they're they're on our side. They're against mandates, and uh, they're for medical freedom. So we've uh, invited them here tonight so that you can get to know them a little bit more. And tonight, we are actually going to start a little differently than we did before. We have a prayer from Don Bryant. If Don would like to come up. Don Bryant is a retired pastor. Thank you, Don. You can go in front of me, Blake. Um, a Don is a retired pastor, a college professor, political activist, and he is chair of Pembroke Rising. Pembroke Rising is also part of Social Grassroots Alliance. So we're all coming together. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's good to be with you. This thing is working, right? Okay, we're there. Um, in, in my in my real life, uh, the one I consider the, the most real part of me, I'm, I'm a pastor uh, for, for 40, 40 plus years. So I, natu that, I naturally go back there, even in circumstances where, you know, it's not front and center. And when they ask for me to lead us in prayer, I, the first thing that occurs to me is, uh, why do we pray? Why do we pray? Uh, and we all know what it means to be in a place in life where we just simply say, facing a circumstance, oh God, help me, right? We, we know what that's, what that's like. Or where there's a gift to us that we weren't expecting, we're surprised, and we say, oh God, thank you. And one of my favorite Bible verses, I'm a, I'm a Christian pastor, is, it's very simple. I, I memorize very short Bible verses or part of verses uh, of a verse, and it, it, it goes like this. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem there to be crucified, and the crowds are beginning to throng, right? We're familiar with, with the great procession and Hosanna, Hosanna kind of thing. Jesus is on his way, and all of a sudden, the, the, along the way with all the crowds, two guys simply said, Jesus, save me. God, save me. And my, my favorite story, it says simply, Jesus stopped. With all the throngs, he heard the one, he heard the two, and we're stopping now and saying, oh God, help us, help our country. We need, we need a deliverance. Use us. And that's what this evening is, is all about, offering ourselves to his action and his blessing and his path that will bring a fortune where we live and what we are. Okay, are we okay? You didn't hear me anything I said before this. True? Okay, let's pray. God Almighty, uh, you hear people who are broken. You hear people who are in need. You hear people that are out of resources. This is what you do. This is the record. And tonight, we offer this to you because we're people who are seeking to make a difference in our time, and it's overwhelming, and it's huge, and it's big, and it's beyond us. And I ask that you be in this moment to fill us, inspire, lead, speak peace to us, but mission as well. We pray for our country, pray for our towns. You love righteousness. You love mercy and love. 
uh, you love right doing. And we ask that you give us that, that energy which brings to our towns good news, that there's a better way. And spare us, we pray, and deliver us and bring us into a new future. Pray for this evening and all who are speaking and leading. May your grace be upon them and each person that's here tonight. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. We really appreciate that. If I could get uh, John Raposo to come up. John is uh, going to be singing the national anthem. And I'm sure he would mind some help if anyone would like to help. Um, John was a corrections officer for 15 years. Um, he's a Christ follower, family man, trade worker, musician, and singer and an artist. Thank you for coming, John. We really appreciate it. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early lights what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous light o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting event, right? Three months. Who was here three months ago? Just raise your hand if you're here. That's it? Right here in the middle, those are all new folks? Well, you missed it. I'm kidding. It was a great event. It was like tonight. It was packed. And I just want to uh, thank you for having me back here. So I'm, I feel like I'm Mookie Betts. Remember back in 18 when the Red Sox won? Mookie Betts would get up to bat. He hit a home run. All right. I want you to look at me and don't expect a home run. I'm just going to do my best. If I get a single or a double... Applaud, but, but a home run would be great. I'm, I'll try. All right. Since last October, since October, can you, is this all right? Should I put it away? Can you hear me without that? No, all right. 
That's a foul. Foul ball right there. Okay. I'm going to do my best with this then. Three months ago, three, what's the best way? Talking over it, not into it. Over it. Just the way. Turn it down. Turn it down. I feel like an obvious. Is this, this is it? This works? Okay, here we go. Since October, three months ago, TCI, you guys know what TCI is? No. Transportation Climate Initiative was repealed, was withdrawn by Governor Baker. The plan to have a gas tax go up automatically, withdrawn by Governor Baker. Followed by the withdrawal of Governor Baker and Karen Polito from running for governor. I have notes because I just want to make sure I get this right. And the other thing that happened was that in the last three three months or so, we were able to raise over a quarter million dollars for my governor's race. A quarter million dollars by thousands of people stepping up and making small donations to give us the chance to be able to make this run. So it's been an incredible quarter leading up to the holidays. And I just want to thank everybody for being a part of that. It's creating the momentum that helped that happen to force Governor Baker and Karen Polito not to run. Those were a lot of big things that happened and really helped set the stage for what I think is going to be an incredible 2022. Now, on the negative side, here's what's happened so far. Mask mandates have been extended for our kids in schools, right? That's a boo, a big time boo. We've had uh, the Mass Teachers Association seems to be pushing to go back to remote learning. That's a boo, right? But even worse is we've seen hundreds of uh, police officers and firefighters, nurses, either leaving their jobs or being fired from their jobs, creating an even greater public safety risk, a greater public health risk, all because of the vaccine mandates that were started by our state legislature. And now even businesses, private businesses are trying to do it. And the biggest boo of all, in my opinion, at this point, is Mayor Wu in Boston creating the vaccine passport. Yeah, boo, woo, exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, who was up there on, on that Monday a few weeks ago when uh, we were protesting the announcement of that? There was a few folks that were here. You were there, I saw you there, that's right. And you know what, we were all called racists for questioning the mayor's policy of creating a mandate that was gonna basically hurt businesses again, and at the same time, really, at this point, we know the science behind the masks isn't working. In fact, the science behind the vaccines is questionable at this point, too. So it's, it's still a tough time because whether the politicians currently in office or the media that doesn't want to cover things like the, uh, the negative reactions to having the vaccine, none of that stuff, the various data is not being released, it is still a difficult time. So our work is not done and not nearly done. And that's why having you out here tonight is so critically important. Um, so I just want to say a couple things, and that is, uh, Don Bryant gave a nice, really nice invocation when we first got started here. I, this campaign for me has been a culmination of a lot of people helping me that in the past hadn't helped before or were new to helping me out in 2018. Uh, so in 2018, we assembled thousands of people across the state. And, uh, but we didn't have the endorsement of President Trump at this time. Now we have the support of President Trump for this election cycle. And I'm really excited about that. And a lot of that I really have is a feeling that, I have a feeling that God is really looking at this race and saying he wants to deliver a better leadership for Massachusetts, better leadership across the country. So I was down at a church in um, Swansea and uh, had the congregation a couple of weeks ago prayed over me, and it was really a great moment because I felt like this race has a higher calling, making things happen for it. The donations, the support we're getting. So I just want you to know that I'm gonna take that momentum that we're building and keep going out there across the state. So I've got events even tonight, I'm heading somewhere after this. I was somewhere for lunch today. I apologize, it's a busy schedule, but it's an important schedule to get out there and talk to as many people as possible and spread the word that we're gonna put government back in their hands. You guys know where I stand. You should be making the decisions over your healthcare decisions for yourself, your children, your families. <laughs> Nobody's job should be at risk because they wanna make their own healthcare decisions, okay? 
And when and when people question the science or question whether it's ready to get a vaccine, they should be listened to just as much as anybody else. In fact, maybe more so. We are the experts of our own families, not government. They shouldn't be co-parenting with us. So I'm excited about the 22 election cycle because I think at this point we have a straight shot to the election day. I'm going to be talking to a lot of folks. And I think the Democrat Party right now nationally uh, not looking great. But here in Massachusetts, they've got a primary. They're going to have to you know, make their case as the people about why their policies are better. I don't think the policies of controlling us more and more with our curriculum for our kids in our schools, I don't think that's going to be working. Defunding law enforcement, getting rid of qualified immunity, that's not a, a policy that I think people of Massachusetts want. So I think this is a chance for you to take back control of government, but you need to be a part of the solution, too. And I'm not just talking about supporting me as governor. I'm talking about running for office yourselves. Because in April and May is municipal elections in Massachusetts, and if you don't think your local board of health is a huge, important part of your life, just look at some of the towns where boards of health are shutting down businesses. Or look at school boards. If you aren't running for school board or aren't serving on it, run for it. Because look what they're doing. They're shutting down these meetings because parents want to go to them, and they're putting it back on Zoom so you have no say. You need to be part of that solution of running for the local office as well. And I will support you. If you're running for office, tell me, and I will be there to stand with you on your uh, kickoff, and I'll be there on election day. And we're going to make sure you win so that we all can win by the end of this year. All right, so that's, that's really all I had to say. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of speakers that are here to talk, so I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to be heard. So thank you guys very much for being out here, and I look forward to continuing this discussion as we go forward. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Jeff. Huge supporter. Really appreciate you coming. So thank you, everybody, for coming. It's so good to see so many people here. Um, last time, we had about 160 people. Tonight, I think we um, went over that mark. So thanks for making this great. We are willing to come to a town near you. Um, so if you would like us to come out, um, if you find a location, we'll help you get the speakers. So we want to get this as big as possible and keep spreading uh, the whole community events, uh, parents getting together, and we all just need to take a stand. So on to our next speaker. Uh, speaking of someone that takes stands, uh, we have Donna Petronelli coming. Thank you, Donna. Donna is from Next Bridgewater. She uh, was a she's a retired guidance counselor. Um, she had uh, she's been a political activist for a long time, a parent activist actually, um, and she helped. Um, she helped create and she was a big part of the Parental Notification Act. Um, so she has a lot of experience when it comes to the laws and civil liberties. Uh, so Donna, if you would like to come up when you have a few seconds of your mind, do you want to get in the front here or would you like to be back here? Come on. Uh, Donna's great. Donna has been in front of um, the legislature speaking before. Um, so she's she's been around town. So thanks for Donna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Good evening and welcome to the South Shore Grassroots Alliance. And I want to add, happy January 6th. <laughs> now, we know they don't like January 6th for many reasons, but we know the real reason. Because we know that in 2022, we are going to take back our schools. We are going to take back our towns. We are going to take back our states. And we are going to take back this country. That's right. So they asked me to give a little bit of background in history. And um, if you bear with me, I'll get into the meat and potatoes. But. Um, the stage was set for this moment in time about 20 years ago. Your schools were reformed with the passing of the Ed Reform Act in 1993. The focus was away from academics, and it was now on standards, outcomes, more known as the Common Core. It was about equitable, equitable funding for students and educators in school districts. 
It was about selecting and purchasing of textbooks. It was mostly about government overview and surveillance to monitor goals and outcomes. And it was about failed schools and districts being taken over by the state. What constitutes a failing district? Low graduation rates, poor attendance, poor performance on standardized tests that measure outcomes, <laughs> making sure the school is structured in the new direction, guidance and mandates through the Department of Education and their proxy commissioner, which at that time was a new position, teacher evaluations based on knowledge and compliance of the new system. The effect on the small town which I lived was immediate and shocking when they hired a new superintendent who wanted to make, make a name for himself in global education. Sight reading became the primary method of teaching in the younger grades. Little emphasis on spelling since children are encouraged to use computers to write complete with spell check. Chicago math was implemented which advised away from learning math facts. New course called Globalism. Great programs like home economics, industrial arts were removed. Students no longer learn to cook from scratch, sew at all, or create anything from wood. Personal questions on papers and exams. Homework for parents on child's math papers because they expected us to learn the new math too. <laughs> Bathroom doors were taken off the stalls in the high school. The Gay and Lesbian Alliance coming in to speak with all the high school students. DARE graduations where the students were taught all about drugs, including how to roll joints and what they can get high off of at the grocery store. The beginning of the annihilation of our history and the introduction of critical race theory, and it comes by many names. The school committee voted to make us a model for the federal school system by becoming a regional training center. History was replaced with social studies, 80-minute classes and block scheduling, a community service requirement, and integrated, integrated classes where more than one discipline was weaved into the class period. It was odd, and it left many of us wondering what was going on. One day, the superintendent sent us all home a letter saying he was implementing outcome-based education Teachers were being sent to Johnson City, New York to get trained. At this time, think back in time, talk radio was in its early days. Outcome-based education, however, already had a bad rap since it had been piloted in pockets of the U.S. since the 60s and had failed everywhere. So why had it survived and why did it become law? Somehow I got a hold of the old Peg Luxick tape called Outcome-Based Education Who Controls the Children. You can still find her lectures online for more clarification. Remember back in the early 90s there were no online, no cell phones, no YouTubes, and the internet and talk radio were in their early infancy. The videotape was all we had after I showed a friend others wanted to see it in the word spread. So many wanted to see it that I had to set up times. A school committee member knocked on the door, wanted to see it. I'm ashamed to say, at that time, I didn't even know what a school committee was. But I showed him. He wanted to come to a meeting, I let him in. Soon on the night, there was a large group at my house. The superintendent showed up at the door. He wanted to see it. I reluctantly let him in after he put his foot in the door. See, I was naive. I thought when they saw how bad it was, they would surely stop. After all, the school committee had children going to school in this town. But they hadn't heard from parents for so long. They had become nothing but a rubber stamp club for the superintendent. They had lost their way, like many today. At this time, we started to see bumper stickers on cars and billboards. Think globally, act locally. It wasn't long before we figured out that this was the global school program introduced at the World Education Forum. 
Our education legislation mirrored the global education plan touted by the United Nations. It was funded by UNESCO, UNICEF, United Nations Population <coughs> Program, and the World Bank. Look at the UN Agenda 21 program for COVID-19 and the schools. You'll find your COVID policy there and your climate change curriculum also. After taking a deep breath, I knew this was a lot worse than I thought, but the war was already on in West Bridgewater. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about what was going on inside these schools because I worked in schools for 20 years and I can assure you teachers and personnel were held hostage in many ways. The superintendents and the administrators were taking orders from the commissioners. They went from policing students to policing personnel, all to make sure we were implementing the new system. A teacher caught writing on a chalkboard was destined to get an ineffective evaluation because the evaluations were designed to grade their knowledge and adherence to the new teaching system. I saw language in their documents to identify resistors. Those of us who resisted had to be smart about it. There were buses of Teach for America students arriving daily to take our positions. Remember, President Obama funded and called them an army of educators. They had all of five weeks training to replace us if need be. Now we waited for the cavalry to arrive and set us free, but that did not happen. Not even when the Republicans took over. We waited for the parents to complain and stop it. That didn't happen. We saw things that horrified us, but we had to talk in dark corners away from the many cameras which were all over the school, compliments of a safety grant. If we were seen talking, it was reported to the principal. Don't expect your schools to change without you. They are a captive operation. But tonight will be a tribute to the moms. And I know there's a lot of moms here. The Massachusetts moms became a force to be reckoned with. We formed the Concerned Parents Group of West Bridgewater. At that time, we were not aware that all over the state, parents were forming them also, just like now. There were meetings popping up all throughout the country, and we traveled all over New England. No GPS, communications were sent through the mail, and we used maps. <laughs> <laughs> Copying and mailing became a way of life. Dining room tables became a thing of the past since the husbands forgot what they looked like because they were always covered in paper. Everyone was obtaining documents, making copies, and handing out things. Home meetings were the norm, and when the crowds got bigger, they were in libraries, church halls, school auditoriums, and sometimes rallies on the street. Back in this day, long-distance phone calls at the kitchen table cost money. We spent it. We moms spent all our money on hosting meetings, mailings, copying, and phone conversations. Because we weren't just going to save the children. We were going to save the country. We were armed with the truth and confident we knew more than they did. Every time we went public, we had documents to back us up. People began to realize if they were going to tangle with us, they better do their homework because they knew we did. Some moms were good researchers, some were good speakers, some were good writers, some were good hostesses, and they threw the best meetings, getting people together from Maine, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. My part went on. I ended up debating the superintendent. I was given 10 minutes on the spur of the moment to rebut what he was saying. That really was all it took. I went on talk radio shows. I wrote letters to the paper. We handed out flyers at the local dump because that's the hot spot in West Bridgewater. <laughs> when we went to a school committee meeting, we went in a crowd. The people who didn't want to do all the other stuff 
just showed up. That helped a lot. We got maybe 20 people to put a call in to our state rep. She showed up to talk with us in the local library. With our children in tow, we marched to the state house with all the groups and lobbied for the parents' rights bill. It is now law, the Parental Notification Act of 1997. Learn it. You need it. Now, was the school committee nice to us? No. They used to make us wait till 11 o'clock at night to speak, but we did. Did they roll their eyes and suck their teeth? Yes, but some listened. I ran for school committee. I was the first one of the group to run. The opposition threw my signs in the swamp. They made up lies. They ran four conservatives against me. And when they couldn't beat me in a debate, they, re they refused to debate. Can you hear that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just tap, tap the mic. Tap the mic. Hello? Okay, this sounds good. <laughs> there were so many signs on lawns in town that people knew something was up. They told people I was too radical. One called me a Philistine. That was a new one. <laughs> a woman from the neighboring town befriended us. Crazy Green and handed out her son. Pass it again. Crazy Rena handed out her son's sex test to everyone she met. She went to the state house and handed it out. Most just thought she was crazy, and maybe that was partially true. But when Howie Carr read that sex test on the air to Lieutenant Governor Paul Salucci, Rena landed a serious blow to sex education. A delegation of moms rented a bus. The moms went to Washington. They testified before Congress at their own expense. One's here tonight. Can you stand up, Shelley? Where is she? Over there. <laughs> would not be complete without talking about the whistleblowers. I want to recognize the people who stood before us. The late Sam Blumenfeld, who made several trips down to West Bridgewater to teach us about the importance of phonics and cursive in a child's language development. I want to recognize Charlotte Iserweit, former education policy advisor to President Reagan, who wrote, the deliberate dumbing down of America. She and Sam's books and lectures are still online. I recommend you watch and read them. When you make enough noise, Washington comes calling. When the Republicans took the House, Dick Armey became the speaker. He was interested in our parents' rights bill, in our movement. The Republicans were talking about a national parents' rights bill. My husband and I picked him up at the airport, and he made the rounds, appearing at some of our homes and churches. It's interesting that the speaker, Kevin McCarthy, is now still talking about making that part of the Republican platform to, in a bid to retake the House. See, history always repeats. I know what some of you are asking. Did I get on the school committee? How many think yes? How many think, no, and everybody else doesn't know? <laughs> are, you, are you just don't want to hurt my feelings? <laughs> no is right. But what I did do was get a phonics first policy passed by the school committee. We had the superintendent out right after the election. We knocked out the committee chairman in the first election year because everyone saw how she treated us. She came in last. The Gay and Lesbian Alliance never came back. I was asked to be part of the search committee to select the new superintendent. 
The second election, we got two of our own on, and they implemented Robert's rules to make the meetings fair and inclusive. Chicago Math and DARE fell shortly after from their own weight. They were determined to be ineffective. I went on to fight for our counties. Again, doing talk radio shows, writing editorials, and debating a then Republican state senator. We worked with Democrats on that one. Five counties were saved, eight exist in name only. Why? You weren't there to fight for them. Counties are important. Who are fighting the mandates? 13 counties in New York are not following them. The counties are there to protect us from tyranny. Now you know why the globalists wanted to get rid of them. So here we are in 2021. We have lost our way. Your state house is surrounded by a chain link fence, locked. Are they even in there? Our capital and the North Shore have been captured. Those people are prisoners. They are masked and can't go to work or go anywhere with their families unless the family is completely vaccinated. They must show their papers everywhere they go. The North Shore has followed suit. West, East, and Southern Mass, are you going to even mount a defense or are you going to fold like they did? Those people will have to fight their way out. Moms and dads, your school COVID-19 policies are discriminatory and ineffective. They are designed merely to coerce your children to get the shot. But we all know it's not a shot. It's eternal shots. You still have local control because you own your schools. You have your representatives on the school boards. The powers that be are after your children. Right now, they, they are discussing bills to have children make the choice to be vaccinated without your permission. If that happens, who knows what else will? Are you working with your school committee to pass policy to make sure that doesn't happen? Are you in discussions? over these ridiculous COVID-19 policies that discriminate against the unvaxxed? Are you putting the school committee on notice that CRT in any form is unlawful and against the Civil Rights Act? Did you inform them of the law? Review sections, especially six and seven. A school not accepting a religious exemption is unlawful. No questions should be asked. Does your school committee know that? Perhaps you need to inform them. Maybe they should know they could be facing criminal charges. Have you thought about running for school committee or board of health? We have flyers and cards we distribute to educate our communities. Will you make some copies and distribute them any way you can? Can you learn your rights and inform your friends that are losing their jobs because of this lawlessness? We have law packets, and there will be more conferences like this one. Some of these ladies work tirelessly, disseminating information on their Facebook pages and Telegram accounts. Are you following them? Many groups are here. Can all the groups stand up and um, announce who you are? Who's, a, who's, a, who's representing a group tonight? Mother Lode is where? Mother Lode. Okay, who else is here? Who are you? Make America Free Again. Make Mafa, Make America Free Again. Who else is here? Pembroke Rising. What is it? Pembroke Rising. Pembroke Rising. Who else? Health Short Choice Massachusetts is here. Who else? Did we get everybody? Uh, health Rights Mass. Did we leave anybody else? We have Abington Mass 
Mandates. Abington Mass against Mandates. <laughs> Jeff Deal <laughs> for governor. Okay. So they're here. Oh, wait. Okay. Who's here? What? Convention of States. Okay. Okay. Will you join one? What will you do to stop the tyranny because the enemy is in the gates? We have our weapons. We have the truth and the law. We don't need anything else. You see, they know that the future belongs to we the people. But we have to take it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. I really appreciate it. So I met Donna um, about a month or so ago. We've been going out, a lot of us. Thank you, Donna. She is so awesome. She will go and speak at other events and rallies. She's really a great person. Um, we met her in Stoughton um, at a group, and we, we listened to her talk. There was a couple of us from Abington Mass Against Mandates that went, and we said, oh my gosh, we love her. We get to have her come at one of our next events, and here she is. We keep in touch um, constantly, and she's becoming a, a great friend, so we appreciate it, Donna. Thank you. Um, so next up, I am going to go out of order because um, I am, uh, my name's Wendy Happel, by the way. I am on school committee. I'm the chair of the Abington School Committee. So thank you. And um, I really have been trying to fight here in Abington um, and fight against Desi and um, speaking of some of the things that, that Donna had brought up, um, I do have a few parents um, that reach out uh, and, you know, express their concerns. And one, um, recently, I've been Facebook friends with her for a while now, but her name's Charlene Piper. And Charlene can come up here. Charlene actually sent us a letter um, two days ago. And uh, when I received it, I was just amazed. I actually emailed her back and let her know um, how much I enjoyed reading it. Um, Michelle sent, uh, uh, um, Charlene sent this letter to everyone at DESE, the whole Board of um, Education, uh, Governor Baker, Karen Polito, um, our superintendent, Peter Schaefer, and myself. And um, so I, I appreciate that. And what we're trying to do, actually, because we've been looking for somebody, uh, Donna is um, the first one to speak about this, that would um, start and you know send a letter out. And we're hoping that other people will follow. She's going to read this letter. Um, and she is uh, going to with that. Oh, yeah, there's also copies on the table if anybody would like it. We're going to... Um, we also have it posted to our uh, website, and so if you'd like to download it and you know send it into your community leaders and the governor and everybody that may or may not listen, we'd really appreciate it because we think that you know the strength in numbers. So if we all get behind the same letter, which is pretty good and accurate, um, would be great. And Charlene actually was on the call uh, that Desi had the other night, so she's going to tell you a little bit more. Thank you for coming, Charlene. I'm not a public speaker. I am just a mother of um, three boys in Abington, and I think I've just reached my limit with this stuff. And it was actually um, the Joint Board of Education held a hearing. I think it was on Tuesday or Wednesday, but anyways, it went on from 11 to 6, and they were taking public testimony for probably about six bills. And um, the last two were on um, eliminating religious exemptions and physician autonomy, and the last one was on masking children in the Commonwealth um, for ages two plus, which just seems bananas. Those kids aren't even out of diapers. So this call went on from 11 to 6. I sat on it the entire time. Um, yeah, it was a long day. Um, a lot of the bills, you know, they went through them, school lunch, all positive things. Um, but the last one, the two-class mask mandate, they started public testimony around 2 p.m., and it did not end until 6 p.m. 
Each person that chose to testify was only allotted two minutes, if that gives you any idea to the amount of parents, um, physicians. There were some mathematicians in there. It was a wide array of people that stood on that call all day. And in four hours of public testimony, there were only two in favor of this bill. One of them was the only woman that got press, um, which was Mary Najimi, the president of the MTA. So out of four hours of testimony, that's all the reporting the public heard was of her two minutes, which I find despicable. But anyway, so this prompted me after listening to all of these concerned parents and politicians and um, teachers talk about what's happening to our kids. So I then fired off this email to Desi. So I just said good morning. I was wondering if any of the DESE members took time out of their day to listen to the Joint Board of Education call on January 3rd. A lot of interesting points were brought up as well as testimony that went on for four plus hours of concerned parents and citizens that were speaking out about forced masking and the harm it is doing to our children. In these four plus hours of testimony, there were only two in favor. This speaks volumes. One of the bills spoke to a 30% rise in suicide, depression, and anxiety among our children since the pandemic <laughs> restrictions began. This should be very concerning to the board. Our kids are stressed, scared, sick of being distanced from their friends, forced to exercise with a mask, and not being able to see faces. You are all directly responsible for this continuing and rising mental health epidemic in our children. These risks need to be weighed and cannot continue to be ignored under the pretense of safety from COVID when we now know that children are not at extreme risk and there are three vaccines available to all children and adults who wish to take one. The benefits no longer outweigh the harm. The harms of starting a third year of oppression of our children are starting to come to light. We have a responsibility to address them. How does the board plan to mitigate these rising psychological effects? It was also brought up that there have been no, not one, long-term studies regarding prolonged mask use in kids. You are now forcing our children into a clinical trial on prolonged mask wearing. One of the other people on the call had cited Titles 21, Section 50. Where is the informed consent from parents for our children to participate in such an experiment? Where is the oversight and review board? What is the expected duration of this study our children are being forced into? We are now approaching year three. I do not consent. My child will not be subject to any possible and unknown risks any longer resulting from this continued mandate. Can you show there are no adverse effects to breathing, mental health, or learning after years of mandating mask use? Please forward this data immediately. My child will no longer be wearing masks at school. The state of his emergency ended in Massachusetts in June. I do not consent for them to go another year with prolonged mask use unless this board can produce a scientific study that observed children in masks six and a half hours a day for two plus years that was done under the state parameters of informed consent with an oversight board and any other parameters you are beholden to. You are robbing them of their childhood and willfully and negligently forcing them to mask without knowing or pursuing knowledge of the effects of years masking in children. Enough is enough. If you listen to the testimony, the people have spoken. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Charlene. That was great. I'm really excited that you came here to speak tonight. Um, so next up, we have um, we have Gary Ines. He is going to be um, talking a little bit to give him to give everybody a little bit of information about himself. Gary's running for state senate, and um, we're very lucky to have him here tonight. And we hope everybody will support him. Come on. Up. Les? Les Molino? Is he here? Les? Can you hear me? I can. All right. 
my name is Gary Innes. I'm running for state senate in the great town of Abington, Massachusetts. Thank you very much for attending tonight. It's so nice to see fellow conservatives gathered together. People like and independence and people like Jeff Deal speaking. This is a this is a great event. This is a great event. I'm running for state senate because Mike Chesner was gunned down and it impacted me and I'm running for state senate. I live in Hanover. My district is Hanover, Abington, Rockland, Holbrook, parts of Braintree, in the great city, although democratically run with a lot of corruption, Quincy. <laughs> I agree as far as anti-CRT, anti-mask, anti-vax. One thing I'm going to ask of everyone tonight, quite frankly, is <clears throat> people like myself are running, Jeff's running and running to another event. My good friend Carrie's running the state senate. She will win. She's been on Fox News. This woman's been on Fox News. My friend Ken Sweezy is running. And we have people that are elected to local political offices. What I really need from everybody here, if you are not running or haven't run, is you need to run. You need to run for school committee, board of health, selectmen. This is one step. The next step to victory is you got to run. If you don't run, we don't win. It's not that hard. I did it. It's been the greatest thing of my life. You meet a lot of people. You make change. You become a better person. So I'm asking everybody in this room, if you haven't run, you need to look in the mirror before you go to bed tonight and say, why am I not running? Because we need more people to run. End of speech. I was going to keep it brief. God bless America. Thank you, Gary. We really appreciate you being here tonight. If everybody could uh, vote for Gary if they live in his town, that would be excellent. Uh, so our next speaker tonight um, has come from West Springfield. So she's come from a far distance to be here. So this is very meaningful to when you have speakers that, you know, come far distances. We don't pay anybody to be here. Um, so everybody's here at their own free will. Um, and we really appreciate all the time that they're giving us. So a little bit about Tammy uh, while she gets prepared is, Tammy is president of EnviroNet. It's an occupational safety and health consulting company, and it's a certified industrial hygienist. She has 30 years of OSHA, EPA, and DOT experience. Um, Tammy is actually going to do a live presentation uh, regarding masks, so she does have a, a few people here tonight. Uh, we have Caitlin Happel, that's my daughter. Uh, we have Jake Spillane, and we have little Justin here. Um, and then Dr. Diggs is going to be a speaker next, and, and he's going to be helping Tammy as well. I think I'm ready. Um, 
There's a saying out there that says, all the world's a stage and all men and women are merely actors. We are all here for a reason, playing out our parts for each other in a puppet theater of experience designed to distract, deceive, demoralize, and destroy the human spirit, to remove compassion and care from the world, and to some people, remove humans from the world. So to allow our morality to thrive, which leads us further and further away from freedom. We need to go across town and to a new theater for a different kind of experience with no strings, where we can live as God intended us to live in abundance, joy, and free, rather than fearful and in servitude. So I want to welcome you to the show, The Unmasking of the Mask. So I want to first give a disclaimer that every man, woman, and child on this planet has been harmed in the making of this current production. Okay? And I really didn't want to put them in it, but we need to, um, they volunteered. So, and that's the one thing when we talk about, no, you volunteered. <laughs> Is that um, in order to put somebody in a respirator, and there is a difference between a respirator and a mask, and that's where the greatest deceit, you know, has come uh, into play, <laughs> is that uh, in order to put somebody in a respirator without actually getting medical clearance, fit testing, um, asking them uh, to do training and so that they can properly fit and assure that it fits, um, it has to be voluntary. The same thing with these masks that you have here, the only way you can get people in them is if you voluntarily consent. So when you send your child to school, you consented. This is all about contracts. A mandate is not a law. You have to have um, the mandator actually accept it. So anybody that's wearing a mask around your chin, in your pocket, in your car, um, you're consenting. So in order to make this go away, you have to not consent. Okay. So when I talk about the biggest deceit, so when um, this all started way back in, was it 2020, 2020, I guess, um, OSHA put out a guidance that said, my mask, if my mask doesn't protect me, but it protects you. Your mask doesn't protect you, but it protects me. Therefore, if we both wear it, we protect each other. That's the biggest lie ever committed. Um, so when we talk about, um, let's talk about the surgical mask, right? This one, right here. And so people will say to you, well, why, um, what about the doctors? They all wear masks all the time. They're in hospitals and all that. Why can't you wear this? Well, there's a big difference between a surgical mask and a respirator. And this is a respirator. They're tight-fitting N95s. They have to have everything in children. What happens in the hospitals is these masks are designed for, um, to stop bodily fluids. So if somebody is sick and they're going to throw up, they're going to sneeze, they're going to cough, they put it on the person, not on healthy people. And when they're wearing them in the operating rooms, the ventilation in there, the amount of air changes that goes on in there is tremendous. There's no way you'll have any infection. And do we ever hear of major infectious outbreaks from surgery? No. And I'm hoping Dr. Diggs is going to like lend a little bit more onto you know that. But they also change the mask because these have a gap. If you have any gap, it's ineffective. It's not going to work. Then we. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the uh, N95 because what's happening now. This is my prediction is that remember when Kraft flew to China and came back with KN95s, right? Because there was a shortage of masks. Well, I had somebody tell me that there was a manufacturer of the N95s that was told in 2020 to cut his production and stop uh, and lay off half his workforce. Fabricated shortage, right? So now what they do is say, well, they get you to wear these fabric masks, right? You need something to wear. So they've got you used to wearing these. I heard last week that uh, the Shrewsbury sent uh, N95s. There's no shortage now. So they gave the N95s to the schools. 
So because what they're going to do is they're going to change their narrative. So they're going to say after two years, these cloth masks didn't work, right? Because we got the serious surge of all these cases, right? Oh, so that's why we're like, oh, we're sorry, it didn't work. We needed respirators. Now we don't have a shortage, so they're going to put them in these. This is going to give them another excuse to keep you masked as they scare the crap out of you on TV that everybody is dying from um, these viruses. No, say no. No, say no. Okay, so when we look at N95s, this is the lowest level. None of these are designed for viruses. They're not going to work. And 95 just means that it filters out 95% of the particulate. That's all it does. But what they're going to say is these N95s, we're going to wear it voluntarily, so we're not going to tell you how to wear it. So an ineffective respirator is going to be more than the cloth. So, but somehow, the CDC and everybody else thinks that these cloth masks have some magic potion, you know, that has been sprinkled on them to be able to protect against a virus. When this doesn't work, even this doesn't work. If you go into, and I don't, I didn't put the cartridges on here because if I opened it, they're out in the open, and then you have, um, it's going to be continuing to absorb, so I didn't want to spend any of the money to just throw it away. So there's a lot of things people have to do with respirators. But one of the things I want to talk about is that a lot of this is marketing, and nobody wants to read. So remember that KN95 we talked about? Because now they're advertising this as the next breathable thing. This KN95 from China, anybody have an idea of what the K stands for? Knockoff. <laughs> China knocks off 90 N95s. What does it say? It's a protective mask. Doesn't call it a respirator, calls it a protective mask. Where this, if you look at the packaging, is a respirator. And when my little elastomeric respirator here, that is tight fitting, if you pull it out, look at how many different iterations and certifications it needs. Okay? So this is every iteration of the valves, the uh, mask itself, the straps. There's a lot that goes into protecting people from viruses. But somehow, for the last two years, this, this is what is protecting you, right? We know that's BS. So, why are they doing it? Oh, actually, one other thing. When I say read the uh, things, if you look at this one, this is the one that Caitlin has on. This one is only good for the, uh, the state of emergency and for COVID. So once the state of emergency is gone, this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> and then my little Disney one, you know. Sorry, Justin, it looks like a little girl, but it's the only one they had left. And look at the fine print. I can't even really read that, but it basically says, do not use in any highly infectious area that you're likely to inha inhale even. Like, okay, <laughs> well, that works. So now we want to know, what are we going to do about this? And I want, so we keep talking about the Great Awakening, right? And what does that actually, so what does that actually mean? So I'd like you to hold your seats because I'm going to show you what they don't want you to know. Okay, so I want to read to you, it's only a minute, uh, about from the, it's from Edward Mandel House, who was the financial advisor to Woodrow Wilson. Um, who was president from 1913 to 1921. I like to do the history, too. I wanted to figure out how we got ourselves into this mess. Why is all these legislators not listening? Why aren't they doing anything? Why are these mass ma mandates? Why do they think they can even legislate this? This was from the private papers of Woodrow Wilson. And I'm going to just stand back here so I don't have to try to hold it. It said, very soon, every American will be required to register their biological property in a national system designed to keep track of the people and that will operate under the ancient system of pledging. By such methodology, we, are con we can compel people to submit to our agenda, which will affect our security as a charge back for our fiat paper currency. Every American will be forced to register 
or suffer not being able to work and earn a living. This is uh, Social Security. They will be our chattel. See, you're nothing but chattel. And we will hold the security interest over them forever by operation of the law merchant under the scheme of secure transactions. Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly delivering the bill of lading to us, will be rendered bankrupt and insolvent. That bill of lading is your birth certificate. Forever to remain economic slaves through taxation, secured by their pledges. They will be stripped of their rights and given a commercial value designed to make us a profit, and they will be more or no more or wiser, for not one man in a million could ever figure out our plans. And if by accident one or two would figure it out, we have in our arsenal plausible deniability. That's what they're going to use. Finally, with somebody understand. Yes. Yes. Thank you. After all of this, after all, this is the only logical way to fund government, by floating liens and debt to the registrants in the form of benefits and privileges. This will inevitably reap to us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations and leave every American a contributor or to this fraud, which we will call social insurance. Without realizing it, every American will, be, will insure us for any loss we may incur in this manner. Every American will unknowingly be our servant, however begrudgingly. The people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of the president of our dummy corporation to foment this plot against America. This is out of um, Mel Stamper's Fruit from a Poisonous Tree. And in his initial um, intro into it, he cites Genesis 2.17, Gift of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof shall die. And if you look at Hosea 4.12, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you reject knowledge, I will also reject you. So how do we cut the strings from the puppet theater? The first step is to say, I do not consent. I do not consent. Okay. And then you declare yourself an American. And once you do that, you get yourself out of the system. And so I'd like to thank my volunteers. And I'd like to have them stand up. Stand up. Take off your mask. Put it on your chair. Grab your hands. Grab your hands. And take a bow. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. We, I really appreciate you coming. If you guys, oh, thank you for taking those away. Um, that was a great presentation. Very good. So um, next up, while Tammy's getting herself together, we um, have Matt Lynch here tonight. So yes, a little bit about Matt Lynch. Um, so he is from Braintree. And he's a former teacher and, cro and coach from Braintree. He graduated Braintree High School in 2005 and began working in BPS in 2010. After graduating from Boston College with a history degree, he worked in a variety of moderate special education programs at, at BHS. After a decade of service to Braintree Public Schools, Matt has run, was run out of his job by local activists after attending the January 6th rally. And, yeah, poor Matt. Instead of letting that be the end of the story, Matt wasn't done giving back to the town of Braintree. He rallied the residents and won a seat on the Braintree School Committee. Thank you for standing. He hopes to be the second shot heard around the world. Matt said the public schools are heading into some tough years and he wants to be a part of the re rebuild. Now is the time to stand up and get involved. Thank you for doing so, Matt. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate the South Shore Grassroots Alliance for putting this on tonight. It's pretty good. Um, so my name is Matt Lynch. In one year ago, I earned the pronouns terrorist and insurrectionist. 
I know. Happy Insurrection Day. So one year ago, my life kind of had a big change. You know, I was actually sitting in a hotel room probably right around this time. And we had gone down there to, you know, protest the election, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, all that crazy stuff happened. We didn't take any part of that. We didn't go in. And we were sitting in our hotel room. And once again, the media is lying. They're gaslighting the people. They're lying about the day. I have friends texting me, like, World War III is going on. I'm like, guys, what are you talking about? None of that really happened. Because so obviously the media was lying again. So I was like, this is going to be the time that I'm going to fight. So I put a picture up on Facebook. Uh, next thing you know, I'm getting called a domestic terrorist all over town. You know, my name was slandered all over there. Little did they know I kind of wanted it. I know that sounds a little crazy, but I had been thinking for a little while, you know, all these great speakers before are awesome. I mean, listen to Donna. I mean, she's like the battlefield commander on this. She can see all of it. I mean, she's been doing it for a really lot longer. She sees exactly what going on before even I was paying attention. Um, but so I saw, I saw that was going on in the schools for the past decade. So I had talked to my boss probably a few months after before I went down to January. And I was like, this is probably going to be my last year. You know, the schools. You know, I, before we started calling it critical race theory and gender theory, and I was, to me it was just progressive ideology. And I had seen it and I was, I was like, this is kind of messed up. Like, we're kind of lying to kids. I, I kind of wanted to do something about it. So I had an idea of running for school committee. But with this climate, and I don't know if you guys know Braintree at all. We have a pretty big activist group on the left in Braintree, and they're very, very well organized, and they know how to get stuff done. So in order to get by them, I kind of knew, I was like, well, you know, I had to get canceled first, right? Because, you know, when they come after you, you know, everyone knows people are afraid to talk these days, where if you say something, if you're a teacher, you say something online, they'll come after you, they'll come for your job, they'll come for your kids, and all these terrible things. So the way I looked at it, well, they took my job, you know, they took my reputation, so when I'm running, what can they really do? So this kind of campaign season, you know, I saw Jeff up here he's, where he's talking, he's running around to, you know, different rallies. My campaign was nothing like that. I mean, I, probably a high school kid could have ran my campaign. I bought some signs, some hats. I opened a Facebook page, made a cool slogan, make Braintree Womps again. Got a lot of people pissed off. And so we put a battle online, but... You know, the, the support I had, you know, all these people reaching out to me, being like, thank you, Matt, finally. Somebody saying the things we can't say. You know, we feel the same way. So many people are upset. The past few years have been nuts. I mean, the, all of power has been centralized. It went all the way from parents. It went all to the large teachers' unions in the state. The point defender at each other the next couple months saying, no, it's the teachers' unions in the state. It's both. Right? Because the, the hands, it comes back down. It should be the parents running things. You know, Braintree, we're a very, you know, loyal town. We always try to think like we're good will hunting type people. But it's always kind of family first type motives. And what I noticed, the school was kind of getting involved in that. They weren't listening to parents. Parents were getting pissed. The kids weren't learning. Nothing was getting accomplished. So last Monday, I swore in to break the school committee. And I have no idea what I'm doing really on that. <laughs> But it, it, I really am excited. You know, I've said to people, I might be the wrong person for the right reasons. You know, I worked in Braintree for over 10 years, coached. Uh, you know, I was probably a better mentor than I was teacher. You know, I loved working with kids. It was awesome. You know, so many of these kids now, you see it, they lack this confidence now. Right? They, they're just, no one has confidence anymore. And I love kind of working with them. I saw someone saying that earlier, so it worked out. Um, I love working with them, and it's kind of a job I want to do for the rest of my life, but you see what's going on. Someone kind of had to step up and kind of make the move. And once I did it, you know, the people in town, they were shocked. I mean, we got 2,300 votes uh, kind of out of nowhere and kind of gave the town some hope that we can start moving this in the right direction. Now, I've been villainized. I made international news when I, I won the UK papers, which I was pretty proud of. Uh, <laughs> But I, I am excited. The reason why I came tonight, I mean, obviously I saw January 6th, it was awesome, but I've kind of been following this crew and seeing what you guys are building. And, you know, so I was talking about it earlier, you know, passports come on the 15th to Boston. Realistically, the next six months to a year, they'll probably come to Mass unless we kind of step up and stop fighting it now. And everybody knows what follows that is the social credit system for the next generation. So it's these, these things where... In the past, I was in the Air Force for, you know, six years in the Guard, three and a half, three and a half active. And I was an intel analyst. Chair Force, Chair Force. And I kind of fought this, you know, the modern world, this fifth generation unrestricted war. 
And when I got back to the schools, because I, you know, I was teaching first, and I went, and I kind of started seeing, like, what was going on, you know, this gender stuff, this critical race theory stuff. And these kids, you know, they really weren't, like, they weren't learning, and they didn't really care. There, were, there was no reason to, like, to do anything anymore. They were just kind of going by to get by. We were kind of just pushing them out there. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know if everyone's from the South Shore here, but I loved high school. It was awesome, you know. I got up, I wanted to go to school in the morning. These kids, you know, kind of lost that, you know, type of feeling. And I think it's coming from higher ups, because I still think, like, I'm, I love Rachel schools, I love Rachel public schools. I'm not here to like, try to destroy the public schools, but they're heading in the wrong direction. And, you know, people are calling it, Rachel lost 500 kids just in the past year and a half. That's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, in the next five years, it's going to be tough. So I looked at it, and I was like, people would be like, well, why don't you fight it from, in, from it within, you know? Be a teacher, you can fight it within. But if you say anything that goes against the grain, you know, they're coming after you, and you kind of lose your job. So now I'm uncancelable, and now I'm all their boss. <laughs> and, uh, I, did, I did pull a fast one. I don't know if any of it was on my Facebook page in October or November. It was, it was actually a hoot, if you guys followed it. We actually took the war to the left. You know, they're really not, they don't really get it, because, I mean, uh, the lefty there, Ch uh, Chomsky, he talks about it. Like, they keep... To keep people subservient and obedient, you have to like operate with a small, like what you can say and what you can't say. I was saying everything you can't say. <laughs> and politically incorrect, they call it. And they didn't really know what to do. They kind of, like, they were like, oh, what's this kid? Is that supposed to say that? And I was like, yeah, well, it did. So what you can do about it? But uh, we got elected. Uh, Monday's our first meeting. You know, there's a great presentation with the masks up here. So our meeting's at one of the middle schools on Monday, and they have the mask mandates. There's no way in hell I'm wearing that mask when I walk in there, so we'll see what happens to it. Uh, you know, the family built this country. It's kind of what's back. It's what the basis of this country is, so I'm not quitting on this country. I'm not running. I don't want to run to Florida. I don't want to run to the South. We'll stay here and fight, you know. They did 250 years ago, so we can, so. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you so much. Cool. It was such a pleasure to meet you. I've been following you for a while. I'm very proud of you. Thank you for all you do for serving. So next up tonight, we have uh, Dr. Diggs, who was over on our floor a little while ago. Uh, Dr. Diggs is an internal medicine physician in private practice. He endorses treatment of COVID-19 prior to the need of hospitalization. He is a graduate of Haverford College and the University of Buffalo School of Medicine, since renamed. Thank you for coming, Dr. Diggs. Uh, first, I want to complain about a couple things. That a uh, mask messed up my hair. <laughs> and I didn't bring a comb, and she doesn't even care. She's not even looking. The second thing I want to complain about is the microphone. I started to take it apart, I thought. As a doctor, when you hear the word diaphragm, you don't think about microphones. <laughs> I heard somebody say the problem with the mic, the, the my diaphragm, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know how it got in there. <clears throat> so uh, I can talk about this topic for about two hours. My intention is to talk about it for about 15 minutes and like five minutes for questions. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to leave shortly after I finish talking. The things I want to talk about are basically the virus itself, uh, illness, the treatment, lack of treatment, the term I'll use is therapeutic nihilism. In other words, there's nothing you can do about it. The vaccines, and then preparation for yourselves. First of all, coronaviruses are very common. They always cause about 20% of colds. Yes. This particular coronavirus has been altered. That's what gain of function research means. And if you go on YouTube, you can see battles between Rand Paul and Fauci about what, whether gain-of-function research was funded by the United States. It indeed was. It's not a secret. When the Obama administration said, don't do this, Fauci managed to ship the funding to China, to Wuhan. Okay? So the gain-of-function research continued. This is an international action. Three months ago, I met a doctor 
named Mei Lin Yan, who's been on the Tucker Carlson Show. She is a virologist who practiced in Wuhan. She says this is an intentional bioweapon. She says there are several prongs to the Chinese Communist Party approach to this topic. One of the big ones was to sow division within the country. But beyond that, the gain of function was to make the virus, a coronavirus, do something it does not normally do. The most striking thing about COVID-19, the virus is called SARS-CoV-2, is that it causes clotting. Most coronaviruses do not cause clotting. The other thing about coronaviruses are that they are unstable. If you look at a hepatitis B virus, there are a few varieties, but it still looks the same now as it did when we first discovered hepatitis B virus. On the other hand, coronaviruses are constantly changing because they're unstable. So therefore, you're seeing alpha, epsilon, lambda, delta, omicron. There's only a few letters in the Greek alphabet. There are at least a thousand variants of coronavirus. So the names are going to get longer because you have to start combining <laughs> letters. This was intentionally, according to Dr. Yan, developed. It was not intentionally released. The timing was slightly off from what they wanted, and it had not obtained this type of virility that they wanted. But she claims that there are hundreds of thousands of people in China who have died, perhaps even millions, especially in Wuhan. Okay? So with that being the case, we as doctors, I'm a clinician, I'm not a researcher, I treat people. We as doctors have been scrambling around the world trying to figure out what to do about something we've never seen before that does not behave in a normal fashion. Okay? So what happened is in 2003, SARS was released. Supposedly a worldwide epidemic, ultimately less than a thousand people in the world died. Nevertheless, they started working on a vaccine. That vaccine was highly effective. It caused the, the macaques, the ferrets, and the mice to develop high levels of antibodies. The problem was that when the animals were re-exposed to coronavirus the second time, they all died. They did not die from infection. They died from debris, which built up in the lungs. So it wasn't like a typical pneumonia that you think of where your lungs are full of bacteria. They died from debris that was in the lungs because the vaccine caused a hyperactivity of one type of macrophage, which does battle against an organism, but it put the other type of macrophage, type 2, to sleep, the type that does the cleanup. So if you can imagine having a battle in this room and nobody ever cleans up. Then you have another battle in this room and nobody cleans up. Pretty soon the room is full of debris and is useless. If your lungs are full of debris, they become useless. And this is why people die. So you have problems with the SARS-CoV-2 in that it causes clotting. Clotting was discovered when they started doing autopsies on patients in Italy that died. You can do something like a CT scan with dye injection looking for clots. If you do that on a patient who has COVID pneumonia, you will not see clots. That is because the clots that you might know about if you know what a pulmonary embolism is, you get a clot in your leg, it travels to your lungs, blocks off the blood, and so therefore you have a problem with breathing. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, it's not big clots, it's microscopic clots that fill the little tiny capillaries. So when you inject the dye, you do not see the dye being blocked in the same way. But nonetheless, there are clots there. The clots are partly made of virus, partly made of white blood cells, partly made of platelets. So we as doctors trying to figure out what to do about this are looking for things that we can safely use to try to treat the problems that we identify physiologically that occur in the case of a COVID pneumonia or a COVID infection of any sort. So we have found things that you can be treated before you get hospitalized. You might wonder, why is it that the estimates are in the United States where there are about 900,000 doctors, there are approximately 1,000 doctors, maybe even as few as 500 doing what I do. That is treating people before they require hospitalization. Why? Well, there are a lot of reasons, not the least of which is over the last 20 years, doctors have slowly been uh, changed into being followers rather than leaders. We've been changed to being follow the guidelines rather than practice medicine. If all you're going to do is follow guidelines, you can complete medical school in about 18 months. Instead, it's four years long, and then you have to do three years plus residency. That is to teach you to think independently, to use your knowledge of physiology, 
pathophysiology, anatomy, pharmacology, etc., to make wise decisions for the best care of your patient. Now all we do is follow guidelines. To say that you should follow guidelines is to assert that there is some sort of uber doctor who's smarter than everybody else, knows more than everybody else, that can tell everybody else what to do. That is not the case with the human body because it's too complex and there's too much individual variation. Okay? So that's what the practice of medicine is all about. It is both a science and an art. It's an art because you have to deal with people and you have to make adjustments on the fly. That is what the treatment that is promulgated by America's frontline doctors, by the frontline uh, COVID critical care doctors, by the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons is all about. We are not claiming we have some sort of randomized controlled study, which would take five or six years to do. We're talking about what is the physiology, what's the problem, how can I help my patient? That has been ignored. When you're dealing with a pandemic, one of the things that has not been dealt with is early home treatment. We're saying, the doctors are saying to the patients, treat it like a bad cold, go home until you're so sick you need to be hospitalized. They don't even want to see you in the office. Have you noticed that? In my practice, I see people with active COVID infections. I've been doing that for the last eight months to a year. Okay? I don't deserve applause, I'm just doing what comes naturally. This is what all doctors have been, should do, okay? The issue is, if a patient says, I have COVID, how many times have you thought you had one problem and it turned out to be something else? Why are doctors suddenly believing that the patients are making the right diagnosis about themselves? Why do you go to a doctor? To get the right diagnosis. But here, suddenly doctors are saying, you're all right, you have COVID, stay home. What if you don't have COVID? How many people are skipping their cancer prevention tests because the doctor does not even want to see them in the office? I can't tell you how many times I've made a diagnosis by examining someone that you can't examine on the phone. Okay? So we're not practicing medicine, and this is happening to the vast majority of doctors. It's like they're under some sort of spell. Either way, we have treatment. We have treatment that can reduce the level of inflammation. I want to describe to you how the disease typically works by my understanding. In the early phases, approximately the first week, the virus replicates, that is, you get more and more. Your immune system starts to fight against it. Because of the nature of the organism, excuse me, because of the nature of the organism, it causes inflammation, and when that inflammation occurs, that's when people get sick. That's when they come to the hospital, or when they come to my office, that's when their oxygen saturation drops. The next phase, Excuse me. The third phase, after inflammation, is when you get the microthrombotic clotting. That is, you get the clots in the lungs that cannot be seen with a normal CAT scan, even a CAT scan with dye injection. Okay? That's when people get put on ventilators. Our early response was to treat COVID pneumonia the same as you treat other pneumonias. So we used a high pressure system to try to force oxygen in, except you had the clots in the capillaries that were not going anywhere. If you end up on a ventilator in an ICU, you basically have a 50% chance of getting out of the hospital. So that makes it all the more important that you get early home treatment. What does the early home treatment consist of? The home treatment that you can do yourself is simply to prepare your immune system. You prepare your immune system with a number of supplements which are pretty commonly known by now. That is relatively high doses of vitamin C on the order of two to four grams per day. Relatively high doses of vitamin D, that is somewhere between five and 10,000 international units a day, which is 250 micrograms. And zinc on the order of 25 to 50 milligrams a day. You'll find a variety of doses, a variety of recommendations, and the reason is because people around the world are trying to figure this out, number one. Number two, various people's bodies have various levels of deficiency that affect their immune system. There's a couple of other relatively simple things. One, what is one of the biggest factors for risk of dying from COVID pneumonia or from COVID is obesity. The rates of obesity over the last 30 years, even though we were fat 30 years ago, we're fatter now, okay? This is a health risk, not just for diabetes, but for dealing with any infectious disease, and especially in this age where you are having designer pandemics. Okay? You need to get your body healthy. You need to get your body prepared to fight. So a rational response to this pandemic would have been simply, hey, everybody, take vitamin D. Hey, everybody, get your weight down. Did you hear any of that? No. You heard none of that. So if, 
even though it might be true that we didn't have a firm answer, there were clearly some things that could be done as a rational response to a pandemic. That was not done. What can a doctor do? A doctor can use drugs. These drugs have been on the market for over 30 or 40 years, and there has been intentional besmirching of their effectiveness and what they're all about. I'll give you one clear-cut example, but it applies to hydroxychloroquine too. You have the president of the American Medical Association go on cable television and tell people that ivermectin is a horse drug. Even without a medical background, you can stick in ivermectin in a search engine, pull up something, and it'll tell you ivermectin was approved for, approved for human use in 1981. It was approved for animal use in 1986. If you live up here, you mostly know about the use in animals because we don't live in the tropics. The fact is that ivermectin has saved more vision around the world than any thousand surgeons because it, the parasite causes river blindness and ivermectin treats river blindness. In fact, the fellow who invented it uh, ended up winning the Nobel Prize. Here you go. Okay. That kind of noise is allowed. That other stuff is <laughs> it, disrespectful to all the speakers. Um, the, so why would the president of the American Medical Association say something which is provably a lie just by looking in the internet and having no medical background at all? This ought to tell you that because the American, the, the United States sent money to Wuhan, Wuhan dispersed the virus, and we have the highest level of the medical association telling you that this is a horse drug, don't use it. This ought to tell you this is not some individualistic thing. This is international. Okay, that's what I believe. I think the evidence supports that. I think the fact that you have a Chinese doctor who defected from Wuhan telling you that it's a bioweapon ought to be enough information. So then, what do you end up with now? So then we end up with a so-called vaccine, which is actually a form of gene therapy. Um, you will find a lot of denial of the effectiveness of the outpatient treatments. You will find a lot of denial that there is anything such as harm from the vaccine, you will find denial that there is such a thing as natural immunity. When you're talking about herd immunity, what you mean is people, that there are so many people who are immune from future infection that they won't spread it around. That is obtained by vaccines. It is also obtained by recovery from infection. But we're being told that there is no natural immunity. There's no acknowledgement of natural immunity. When you're talking about whether someone is safe to go to school, safe to go here, safe to go there, there is no acknowledgement of natural immunity. So if this is something that public health has known about for decades and we're ignoring it, it again makes you want to go, hmm, okay? So the things that I'm trying to convince you of is two things that are non-medical. One, you're not alone. And two, you're not crazy. The things you can do to prepare are, as I mentioned before, one, get your body in shape. That round is a shape, but it's not the one I have in mind. <laughs> Secondly, to get your diet in shape. That is to have adequate doses of vitamin C and vitamin D either in your food or by supplement. There are a number of antioxidants which are also useless. I mean, to where slip, also useful. <laughs> <laughs> including resveratrol, uh, quercetin, uh, alpha-lipoic acid, N-acetylcysteine, melatonin, coenzyme Q10. There's a whole list of them. They're not secret. Um, and the third thing is to pay attention to what's going on around you. I want to tell you something I just read, and I really don't know how to interpret it, but it was released by an insurance company in Indiana. What they describe is that there's been a 40% increase in deaths for people between 18 and 40. If you look anything at all at what's happening with coronavirus, the overwhelming majority of people have two characteristics. One, they're above 70, and two, they have multiple comorbidities such as heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, cancer, and other things. So why are we getting this sudden surge, according to an insurance company, between people from between 18 and 40? That is yet to be investigated. But if you want to think for a second, try to think of something that that age group has suddenly got that they never had before. 
So I want to leave five minutes for quick questions, and we then I'll move on to the next speaker. Yes. Are you accepting the Well, first of all, my office is outside Springfield in Wilbraham. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, uh, yes, I am accepting the patients. I don't take any insurance. It's a what we call a direct primary care service. It's on JohnDiggsMD.com. Somebody here? Yes. Okay, it, it, the, first of all, I could talk about this topic for two or three hours, so there's unquestionably a lot of stuff I'm leaving out. The question is, do people get who are vaccinated, do they shed? I think it's worth the time to simplify what these so-called vaccines, which is the improper name, but everybody uses it, and, and the word choice is not accidental. I mean, vaccine makes you comfortable because you've been getting them since you were born, right? So when somebody says vaccine, you say, oh, yeah, sign me up. But that's not what's going on here. What these shots do, all the mRNA shots and Johnson Johnson, which is DNA, it's just in the body it gets converted to mRNA. What they give your body are instructions of how to make spikes. The spikes are the most toxic portion of the SARS-CoV-2. If you've seen the pictures, it's generally thought to be shaped like a beach ball with a lot of spikes sticking out. When you get a vaccine, it teaches your body how to make spikes. It turns on spike production in your body. I have yet to see the off switch for making spikes. In fact, cardiologists across the country describe very same side effects after the vaccine that they saw with people who had active SARS-CoV infection, whether it's rhythm disturbances, Vascular instability with high blood pressure, low pressure, uh, super fast pulse, normal pulses, all this variability. So it teaches your body to make spikes, and then your body reacts to those spikes, which it made itself, by forming an antibody which fits the spike to neutralize it. So if we pretend the spike is the shape of my left hand, I wear a size and a seven and a half glove, the antibody would be a left seven and a half glove. If the corona what did I tell you about coronaviruses? It's Unstable. Okay, it keeps changing. Changing. <laughs> um, and therefore, if it suddenly develops a six finger, the five finger glove doesn't fit. If it turns into a right hand instead of a left hand, the left handed glove doesn't fit. So that's what's happening to a large degree, I believe, in vaccine failures. It's not so much that the antibodies are fading away as it is that the coronavirus is unstable. This is why you're seeing so many double vaxxed boosted people still coming up with infections. Okay, yes. The question is why all this coming from China? Well, one, China is a totalitarian government. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. And if you're not careful, you'll be living in a totalitarian government, too. The difference between the vaccine immunity and the natural immunity is this. Your body, first of all, has natural killer cells. It doesn't have to recognize coronavirus. All it has to do is say, you don't belong here. I'm taking you out. Natural killer cells is the primary reason that young people don't get very sick from COVID, because they knock it out before it has a chance to take, take hold. The antibodies are your body's reaction to something it's seen before. Compare this to your house. If you have an alarm system in your house, you have guards at your house, somebody breaks in your house and sets fire to it. The next time you see somebody coming to your house with a torch, you say, get that one. However, if instead of an arsonist with a torch comes to your house, an ax murderer comes to your house, you say, oh, come on in. Never saw you before. The antibodies are your body's adaptive immune system, adapting to what's been seen before. Okay? Natural immunity, on, on the other hand, recognizes multiple parts of the virus, not just the spike. That's why natural immunity can be more enduring, more robust than vaccine immunity, which is very narrow, which is only oriented towards the spikes. I'm going to move on because there's like five questions and we'll stop, I think. I don't know what my time is. Yes? Um, to overseas pharmacies to get ivermectin, and they started intercepting some of the ivermectin. How do you get ivermectin to the patients in Springfield? 
how do I get, I go back to my patients in Springfield? Well, there are a number of sources that are popping up because pharmacists are kind of ticked off too, some of them, okay? And the, the, uh, what I do is I use one particular pharmacy in Simsbury, Connecticut, which is an independent fellow. Uh, there are a number of mail-in pharmacies around the country. The problem, of course, is that if you're sick, you don't have time for mailing in. To, I mean, it's better than nothing, but still it may take an extra three days. That's what I've been doing, and I have had some pharmacies that have filled it. I do want to take time to explain the... So, it's called Hop Meadow Apothecary in Simsbury. I do want to explain something about the drugs, because we commonly hear, ivermectin, we commonly hear hydroxychloroquine. 95% of the time, I write prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine when appropriate, rather than ivermectin. In my viewpoint, and this is my personal viewpoint, they are of equivalent efficacy, especially early in infection. The reason I prefer the hydroxychloroquine is because the dose of hydroxychloroquine is the very same dose we use for other indications such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. The dose of ivermectin, on the other hand, is dramatically higher than what's normally used for parasites. Not only that, but you're also using it for five days in a row, which we don't do for parasites. So that's part of the reason I use hydroxychloroquine more than ivermectin. I had a colleague who got sick the same time I did. I took the hydroxychloroquine. The other person took the ivermectin. Guess who got better faster? It was pretty much the same. <laughs> okay. Um, furthermore, the ivermectin cost a lot more money. Okay. Um, yes? Thank you. Either one. Uh, COVID is a hoax. There is no virus. There's a, a psychological operation. Is that a question? Uh, it's going to be a, a mass mind control. Well, because of the number of people, please get to the question part. Well, I wish you would look into this because it's very counterproductive that you're going along with the official story and telling people to be scared of a virus that doesn't exist. Considering it counterproductive. All right. Thanks. Um, so my question is to um, the reporting of adverse events. My mother-in-law, uh, after she had COVID, then she, about four months later, got her first shot. She then developed autoimmune lipid, autoimmune lipid encephalitis, I think I said that correctly. Sure. So I did a little research myself. I'm in life sciences myself. Um, I did some research and I found something like maybe three cases of encephalitis. So my question to you, doctor, is do you feel that the reporting from these hospitals is being done um, as it should be, like truly? Very clearly, the reporting regarding adverse effects regarding coronavirus is not being done properly. Despite that, you have the CDC's collection system, which is voluntary, called the Vaccine Adverse Effects Reporting System, which has passed the 1 million mark in terms of adverse effects, okay? It has passed the 20,000 mark in terms of deaths which are probably related to coronavirus. There are some very famous people that died within short time of getting coronavirus. Hank Aaron. Floyd Mayweather. Oh, excuse me, I meant to say Marvin Hagel, not Floyd Mayweather. He's still around. <laughs> Reports of his demise were premature. And uh, for you rap fans, DMX, okay? You hear the stories about them dying, but you don't read anything else. More recently, easy one to look up, New York Times reporter. Went on television, says, get your vaccine. I just got mine. 24 hours later, he was dead at 49 years old. Yes? Hopefully a quick question. I've seen multiple recipes online various platforms about making um, hydroxychloroquine. Okay, the question is about making hydroxychloroquine from grapefruit? Yeah. Okay. There's a couple of lemons, a couple of issues about this. Number one, how many kinds of lemons are there? Many. Many. Which are more tart than others? So the end result is you end up with a product which has variable potency, even if it works. So if you have another choice, I wouldn't recommend it. However, if society falls apart and you need it, I would do it. But at this point, you can get hydroxychloroquine. Okay. okay. I'm not recommending make it. I'm not recommending taking a horse product because you have to know how to do dilution properly. And furthermore, I don't know that the, the uh, hydroxychloroquine, excuse me, the ivermectin from tra tractor supply doesn't have other things which are not good for human beings because they weren't tested on human beings. Two more. If someone gets the vaccine, does that affect your own immune system from not working properly? There are a number of vaccines which can affect your immune system later. For example, there's a group called Cochrane Report, C-O-C-H-R-A-N, which actually looked at the flu vaccine. And it showed a few things that I think are interesting. It showed that flu vaccine did not lower hospitalization and death in a certain group. Okay? But it further showed that the people who got the flu vaccine one year 
had higher rates of infection the next year. Okay, that's in the Cochrane reports. It's well documented. It's not publicized, but that's what the situation is. In regards to the coronavirus, um, I don't know the answer because not enough time has passed. But there's certainly enough reason to be concerned. There are all kinds of reports, which I cannot confirm or verify, that people are having explosions of cancers, that people are having increased rates of heart disease and strokes that they weren't having before. They're, and this, is again, goes back to the initial question about reporting in the VAR system. It is substandard, and this is something that should be easily verifiable. And this is part of the reason that I think this report from this uh, insurance company, which does not have an axe to grind, came out with these numbers. I think that needs to be investigated very deeply because I'm very suspicious about that. That's the last one. Novavax, do you have any idea on that? Novavax is a vaccine that is based on the traditional way of getting a vaccine, that is taking an organism, either killing it and taking parts of it, or impairing it so it's not so strong and then making a vaccine out of that. Is it possible that it works? It is possible. Can I tell you that it works? I don't know yet, number one. Uh, but I can tell you this much. So far, we're getting false assurances of safety, which are inaccurate. So I don't have any reason to jump on Novavax simply because it's familiar technology. We still have to wait to see how it actually works. Typically, it takes 10 years to form a vaccine, and eight years of that is just safety testing. I want to point out something. This will be the last comment I'll make, and I'll hang around for a few minutes to answer questions individually. The, if you have cancer, and in the, in, there's a 90% chance you're going to be dead in five years, you might take a drug that has a 10% chance of killing you. In that case, the most important thing about that drug is its effectiveness, and lower on the list is its safety, because your goose is otherwise cooked. In the case of a vaccine, it's a completely different philosophy. You are giving a intervention to healthy people. Therefore, the most important thing is safety above everything else. Yes. Not a fact. Yes. You cannot do long-term safety trials in a short term. And that's what we're being told has been the case. It is false. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Dr. Jiggs. You are so informative. He did say that he's going to be staying for a few minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm sure you can approach him. Might be best. There's a little um, area out there, Dr. Giggs. I don't know if, if you'd like to go out there, Jen, want to direct anybody that would like to speak to Dr. Diggs further. Um, so next up, we have our own Ken Sweezy, and Ken is running for state rep, um, so Ken um, wants to become the next state rep of the 6th Plymouth District, which now includes Duxbury and parts of Marshfield, Pembroke, Hanson, and Halifax. Ken was raised in Hanson, and his family has been active members of the community and own a small business in Whitman. I think it's Sweezy Fence. Great. Um, he went on to attend Boston College High School before going on to La Loya University and, uh, in Chicago, where he got his bachelor's degree in forensic science. He then served with the St. Louis Metro Police as a fingerprint examiner for four years before taking a job with a private lab back home in Massachusetts. He is a member of the Hanson RTC and on the Economic Development Committee for the Town of Hanson. If we could please give a round of applause to Ken Sweezy. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I will be very brief, I promise. Uh, so as she said, I'm running for state representative of the 6th Plymouth District, which has been uh, so kindly gerrymandered by my soon-to-be predecessor, Josh Cutler. Uh, so I have Duxbury, parts of Marshfield, Pembroke, Hanson, and Halifax. So if there's any of you in this room that are a member of any of those towns, residents, uh, I would love to meet you before you head out. Uh, we have heard tonight um, a lot of issues, a lot of issues that we all care deeply about that affect us, that affect our businesses, our children, our families, every aspect of our life, right? So what, what do we do next? 
we've, we've, we've aired our grievances. We'll continue to air our grievances. It's so nice to be in a room full of like-minded people. We have solidarity. But the reality is we live in a state where less than 20% of residents are enrolled Republicans. We are unable to win elections if only the people in this room vote. The most important thing is not only realizing what's been done to us, our children, our family, our businesses, but what we can do about it. That's every time you're at the PTO or a book club or at church or with friends or having a block party, you just talk about issues. You talk about issues, you relate to everybody. We get people motivated. We have one of the highest unenrollment rates in the country. There also is not actually a majority Democrat enrolled population in Massachusetts. The majority is unenrolled. That is where in 2022, we are going to win the governorship. We're gonna pick up seats in the legislature and I will be picking up the 6th Plymouth District. We have seen what bad leadership does. We have seen what happens when people take votes for granted. It's not those people, it's not the people in this room right now. We, we know, we've, we've talked about these grievances. But your neighbors who have kids who run a business, not everybody can read the news every, every day. Not everybody can run for school committee. You know, we, we're just trying to get through. We're trying to work, support our families, live our lives like we were promised. We did the right things. We showed up to class. We got a job. And now those are the people that are not being rewarded for working hard. Those are the people that are being thrown under the bus when Democrats and leadership sees the bus coming. They are relying on you to keep doing the right thing so that they can keep doing the wrong thing. They are relying on you to keep doing the right thing so that they can take votes for granted and they can legislate whatever they want on Beacon Hill. That is where the change starts. It starts with you all being involved, being active, holding signs, donating, voting, and then the most important part is motivating others. The most important part is showing up to things like this, bringing something that you know you just talked to your neighbor about last week and telling them, hey, you should see this candidate or talk to this organization or see papers written by Dr. Diggs. Everyone has a role to play. All of us speaking, all of you out there. It's so important. Yes, thank you. We, we really can't rely just on, on, on me or Jeff or Dr. Diggs. It, it, we can't do it by ourselves. It's going to take everybody, and the success of the Commonwealth and the country is all connected. I only represent 44,000 people. There's 7 million in the state and 360 million in the country. We are doing this, I'm doing this, to start here, to start with the 44,000, to start with the 150, 200 in this room, to go all the way to the top and to affect the most amount of change that we can so that we can take back our lives and the image that we were told would happen when we worked hard and did the right thing our entire lives. And that's what these elections and these races are about. So it's good that we look back, we see where the issues are, we have our issues, we make sure that parents have a say in our children's education. Very important. We make sure we support law enforcement. I was a member of for four years. I saw firsthand how cops were treated, how violent cop crime was skyrocketing. Those are issues that have to be addressed. We see inflation. You hurt when you go to fill up your tank at the pump. All of these things are very serious. The pandemic, we talked about the virus and, and how it's being politicized. How do we help our businesses recover? These are the X's and O's. These are the policies all in act to make sure that we positively change those things. But a lot of it is philosophy. We think about the way our government is treating us. We think about how the government is burdening you, your family, and your business. That's what we gotta change. We gotta go to Beacon Hill, not with just, hey, I'm mad that you did this to me. Hey, I'm going to make positive change. I'm gonna be the first one on Beacon Hill that says this is what needs to be better for the future, not just to grieve about the past. And it has to be too prompt. For too long, we've allowed Democrats to say, oh, we're the party of the future because we worry about your children with, with climate change or with student loan forgiveness. You know, they get the bright and shiny future. Here's nice things. No more. We don't have to let them have that. We will not concede that to them. Right. We are the party of the future, and we will show them that our policies and the way that we will stop the burden of government is going to make us the party of the future, make the Commonwealth better, and make this country better. So that's what this campaign is about, is the future. That's what everyone in this room should be about, is the future. 
and that's what my campaign is. It, it, it's about people, and it's about our future. I know there's hands up. I promised I'd be brief, so I'm helping Wendy out and making sure we're on time. But I will come over and talk to you guys, okay? I will talk to anyone who wants to before I leave. So thank you for your time. Thank you for this great event, and thank you for letting me speak, everyone. Ken, thank you for coming. I got my eye on him a uh, um, couple meetings ago. I don't know. I see like a governor in the future, if you ask me. But <laughs> let's get him some experience first as a state rep, okay? Um, so next up, we have uh, Samantha Muse. Samantha Muse uh, might be um, familiar to some of you. She has the drop spot. And uh, she was here at our last event. And um, she's going to be speaking uh, for a couple of minutes tonight. And um, here she is. Thanks for coming here, Samantha. Hi everyone, I'm Samantha Muse. I own The Drop Spot in Bridgewater and I'm the founder of Stay and Play Children's Museum in Bridgewater. Um, I, I do not have a childcare program, I want to make that clear because the bureaucrats in Massachusetts think they own that word, so um, it is similar to a childcare program, but I can't use that word. Um, and the reason is, is that we've been fighting um, what is going on in Massachusetts for a long time, um, for about four years now, and I just didn't know, I guess, how deep it ran. Um, our program is an hourly program, so we're not like a full-time childcare program. We have like first responders and um, stay-at-home moms who drop off their kids for a couple hours. So four years ago when we opened, the state conceded that we were not a childcare program and we had an exemption to licensing. Um, and we held that for um, the first few years of our operation. And when we reopened after COVID, the state approached us and said that we were going to take a license for childcare. Uh, which I started to comply with. Um, and then as things got worse and worse, I saw that we were going to have these mandates for children, and I decided that I just wasn't going to fill out the application for licensing. So I instead formed a private membership association that's similar to a VFW, so our consumers are no longer consumers, they're members. Um, so the Supreme Court has ruled about a dozen times that um, the state and local agencies and government cannot interfere with the private contracts of citizens. So, thank you. Um, so on September 15th, the state entered our program and told us that we were operating an illegal childcare program, to which I responded, you're trespassing. <laughs> So they left and they returned, um, I believe it was October 9th, and they gave us a cease and desist and told us that we needed to stop operating immediately. So my attorney informed them on the phone that they needed to return with a warrant, and they have not been back. So we are currently operating as usual, and all of our families are aware um, that we are operating this way, and they've signed a contract to um, privately contract with us. Um, we do follow most of the regulations as far as like our ratios and things like that as far as safety, but we have not complied with anything as far as masking or uh, vaccination or anything of our staff. Thank you. And right now, um, we're being threatened with $250 fine um, or two and a half years in prison per violation, which is every child that we take per day. So I think as of the end of uh, December, we were up to 1,100 years for me in prison. Yeah. <laughs> I like to joke and say that I'm going to do more time than Charles Manson. So... Um, I, and I know I spoke yesterday in Boston at the State House, and a lot. Thank you. And a lot of people came up to me after and apologized for what I'm going through. And I think I gave the wrong message there. I just want to say um, that I'm not worried or afraid. I think I'm blessed um, to be in this situation because I maybe am the only one in Massachusetts that's in the position that I'm in uh, where I've never held a license with the state. I've never signed a contract with them. I've never agreed to follow any of their terms. 
So um, I'm in a really good position to fight for our rights. And I think that what we need to really make clear is that there needs to be a reasonable accommodation for childcare and school um, for people who don't want their children to be educated by the state, whether it's because of a religious or a philosophical view. Um, and the Supreme Court has already ruled on this, and they've already given us this accommodation, the Private Membership Association, and any business can operate this way. Um, there are groups out there that will help you if you own a business or you know a business owner. There's a lot of medical facilities that operate this way, even in Massachusetts right now. Um, so on Facebook, there's a group called uh, PMA, The Power We Didn't Know We Had. Um, and there are a group of attorneys nationally that will help you establish these PMAs. Um, it's not a huge amount of money for a business to establish. I mean, it's not cheap. I'd say, I'd say it's a few thousand dollars. But um, to protect yourself in this situation, it's worth it. Um, I don't know that it's going to have, like, complete legal protections, but it's something. And it would. it's already been ruled on by the Supreme Court, so it's at least more than just going it on your own. Um, but as of right now, it seems to be working for me. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, I'm very widely hated. Um, people generally know who I am. So if anybody's thinking about running for office, I could run against you, and they could bash me, and you could just, like, slip right in. So, okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys for coming. Have a good night. Really appreciate your coming, Samantha, again. Uh, we have, next up, we have our friend, John Tr uh, Raposa. He's going to be coming up, uh, give you a little bit of a description about himself. Um, but I just wanted to make a couple of announcements, if I could. And that is that the food truck is going on its last call. So if anybody would like food, now is the time. They have some really great homemade um, items. So... Um, we have John here. John uh, was working. He's been let go. And so he has created a song. Um, and thank you for coming back up, John. And once John comes back up, then we will have um, two more speakers uh, and uh, Rayla Campbell. So thank you. So good evening, everyone. And my name is John. Um, just to kind of keep it concise, I uh, put all my thoughts down over here on paper. I'm going to read that off to you. And um, then I'm going to continue on with a song that I wrote. Um, there's some things that make us who we are. And there are some things, those things that make us who we are, they affect what we do and how we do it. I am a Christian. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a friend. And among other things, until December 8th, I was a correction officer. In that order, each of these things influenced each other. What makes me a Christian has grown a need in me to do what's right in God's eyes. I just met the end of that 15-year career in the Department of Corrections. I started in 06. I got a low score of 71 my second time around trying around for the job. But what I lacked in brains, I believe that I had in heart. And I have a little bit of proof from that directly from the Department of Corrections because in the class of 298 in that 2006, they gave me something called the Banner Award. And the Banner Award was given to recognize effort, pride, program interest, and desire to achieve excellence, which I didn't do for that praise. Even though the Department of Correction recognized my character, my work ethic, and my influence as a person and employee, then and till recent, they've now forbidden me from exercising the very things they praised me for because this time my conclusion differed with theirs. 
It was through the same processes and standards that were expressed in those fruits that they tasted in my tenure. I have a right to decide and to act on what I believe is right and good for my family and I, regardless of what anyone else thinks. I just wanted to do my job and do it well, enjoy my life with my family and live for my God. On October 17th, however, there was a mandate that was put in place. And rather than upholding the standards in our state and even country's Constitution and Bill of Rights, whose statements and declarations are good for people in general, the Department of Correction, with its administration from the top down, with and under a tyrannical and destructive Baker administration, have colluded together to take part in and bring about the coercion or forceful theft of both the rights and or livelihoods of myself and doubtless many thousands of others against their wills. I served a five-day suspension in October. That was followed by a commissioner's hearing. And after a few weeks of their deliberating and conclusion, I had a 10-day suspension which ended on December 8th with my termination. This has been the catalyst to a major upheaval of my and my family and others' lives. By God's grace, I've held the line, and in doing so, I've been able to both stand against these atrocities as well as provide for my wife and three children, 7, 9, and 11. I do thank both the department and Charlie Baker for giving me the privilege and opportunity to show my family, friends, and all others who are paying attention to what's going on, what it means to stand in and for the truth, and in my case, God's truth, and what is right, even if it comes with great pain and cost. I am to love my neighbor as myself, and so I can't stand for such a standard as is being promoted or submit under it. Stemming from these sentiments, I've written a song that encompasses the perspectives and experience, experiences myself and other correction officers routinely endure for the safety and welfare of the general public and the provision of our families. Since we've have, we have continually worked together and helped to protect one another, I made a song and basically asking, why can't we do the same thing and stand together with one another for a purpose just as dangerous and important, but far more reaching? I also call on anyone else who sees what's going on to hold the line, whether you've been forcefully coerced otherwise affected or not. I recognize that the forceful attack on our fundamental freedom to choose to meet our own health needs is one that endangers all our other freedoms in this country. Popular opinion or science consensus on health doesn't give the right to anyone to impose a physical injection on me or anyone else. Life and liberty are not negotiable rights. They are given to me by my God. It is only so long that a bully degrades from, steals, and otherwise afflicts the weak one, the quiet kid, before he stands harder than that coward ever could, or he gets his big brother. I'll hold the line with and for my brothers and sisters in blue and for the rest of those that are affected by these things. And I'll do it because it's the right thing to do. And so for the glory of God and for the good of my neighbor, I'll hold the line. And so I ask you, what are you going to do?
surges. I've watched men fight and bleed. I've watched men die inside and out. Seen women lose their minds and so much more. I've held the line. Assaulted, showered in piss and feces, been baptized in saliva, been called every name imagined, got every kind of complaint, hot corn, that dark blue prison garb. I've worn that badge with a sense of pride while walking those dreary halls. Oh, oh, oh. 
very much, John, for coming and telling your story and sharing your beautiful song with us. We really appreciate it. So next up we have Kelly. Next up we have Carrie McCray. She's been all over the news lately, so um, <laughs> good for us. But they're trying to make it bad. Uh, Carrie is running for state senate. She's got a story to say, though. So um, Car Carrie was elected uh, to the Bourne School Committee in May of 2021. As a newly elected member, she spent time listening, learning, and observing the needs and opinions um, of her community. Shortly into her term, it became apparent the issues that were her citizens were very concerned about, and so tonight she's here to talk a little bit more about it. Thank you for coming, Harry. And can you be available after this for questions, too, if anybody has any? Thank you. Yes. So um, I will keep this um, short and sweet. It's been um, a great night listening to everybody's stories. And it seems like we're all fighting the same battle, right? We just want to have our liberty, our freedom. And um, so I'm not going to go into details. I, I am running for a state senate in the Plymouth Barnstable District. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, really quickly, basically, I decided to run for school board. I'm a teacher. I have been um, a teacher for a little over eight years. Um, I am still um, working in a district, a school district on the Cape for uh, a night school program. And it's uh, with children that, you know, have special needs and have certain situations where they've come back to school. Unfortunately, um, I did lose my job um, in Hanover um, as a teacher recently this, this school year. And, um, and it was because on the school board, basically real quick, I said that if I run for school committee, and I made a cute little video, campaign video, I said um, I will make sure that if I'm on the board school board that children in our town are not taught critical race theory. Um, thank you that children are not taught that our uh, country was founded on racism. Thank you. And then the third one was that children are not taught that they can choose whether to be a boy or a girl. Um, so that really got them heated and a little flustered, if you will. Um, so they had a, a meeting, public comment, um, quite a few um, Liberal activists came out and said, you need to go, you're a homophobe, you're racist, you need to resign. To which I replied, "Replied, I'm not resigning. Um, <clears throat> I am still sitting on the Bourne School Board. And honestly, I received a message, a couple of messages that said, you know what, you're being so strong, that's awesome, you need to stand up, and I'd love to see you run for something else, maybe state senate. Um, Susan Moran is our current sitting um, uh, senator, and people said, you know what, she's a little too progressive for us. And I said to my husband, what do you think about this idea? And he said, well, let's look into it. So that evening, we had a conversation, and he said, listen, how much worse can it get? You've already been called a racist, a homophobe, a transphobe, and so on and so forth. So I said, all right, let's do it. What else can they throw at me? So um, now I'm on a mission to uncover everything that is going on in our public schools. And let me tell you, it is. I didn't think it was. Even as a teacher, I was living my own little world as a business teacher. Um, but I now have made it my, uh, I don't know, focus, if you will, to uncover and present everything that the Department of Ed is teaching and telling our dis districts to teach our children. So, if you follow me, thank you, um, if you follow me at Carrie for M-A-K-A-R-I for F-O-R-M-A, um, you can follow me. I update probably every other day with new information, things that are buried in the websites that they make it difficult for us to find, but I find it and I bring it to you because we need to take our schools back. Thank you, Carrie, I appreciate it. Um, did you say what uh, counties you represent? 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Towns. Plymouth Barnstable. Yep. Plymouth Barnstable County is Carrie McRae. Thank you so much, Carrie. So next up, we have Lynn Greenwood. Lynn is the co-founder of Health Rights Mass, a mother of three kids who stood up on August 26, 2020, and she hasn't sat down yet. So um, here she is. <laughs> Who's looking out there? I'm sorry. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody was was in Boston yesterday at the State House. Anyone? Um, so Julie Boris, who is the MC, she's kind of the fearless leader at the Health Rights MA. Um, and I also was on the hearing on Tuesday for the bills. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that woman's still here that, that testifies. So that was a great day. So part of what, I'm going to be really quick. We have a bill that we, kind of, that's how Health Rights Mass got together. We have S1122. Um, there's a few other bills I'm going to talk about, and I'm just going to kind of say how I got here is uh, I have, my oldest son is 18. When he was four, he was vaccine injured. So I've been in the vaccine injured world for about 14 years. Um, it is real. Um, and then I, five years ago, I came down with uh, Lyme disease. So, um, and I was debilitated and the doctor said there's nothing wrong with me. So I, if, you've, if you've ever gotten to the Lyme disease world, it uh, kind of opened my eyes to the CDC. Um, there's a lot of things kind of happening now that are very familiar. Um, the CDC goes around and tries to shut down doctors that treat uh, Lyme because they do not want to treat Lyme, because if they treat Lyme, they might come up with a medication that will make them three or four hundred million dollars. They don't want to treat it. They want to get a vaccine. So that's, that's and it's also, I, in my research, it is a bioweapon. So on March 20, 2020, for me, it was kind of like Groundhog Day. I was like, All right, I've been here, been here, done that. So that's kind of when my world changed. And then when Baker came out with the flu shot mandate, I was like, nope, not happening, because my son was injured by the flu mist. So, um, so that's kind of, so a year ago today, we were at the State House, I met Julie Boris, she had the bill, we presented it to Senator O'Connor. So he was our presenter, which was great. Um, so it's, it's basically, uh, you, you cannot be coerced into a medical treatment, and you can't lose your job if you choose not to take that medical treatment. So this was, this was all based on the flu shot mandate, we knew it was coming down the road. Um, we had our hearing right before Thanksgiving. Uh, it's in the Judiciary Committee because we have it tied to education. Um, and it was, uh, it was even longer than the hearing we had the other day. And uh, Rep. Mike Day is the chair of the Judiciary Committee. He was, he was excellent. I heard from someone who knows him that he was listening. Um, if this bill got passed, everything would be over as far as these mandates. So it's a huge bill, clearly. Um, we need lots of pressure. Um, you need to, at this point now, it's in the Judiciary Committee, and they have to recommend it to go to the floor for a vote. Uh, 6,000 bills get presented every session. Only 200 approximately go to the floor. So if they don't hear from you, as a, if the action is here. Like We have to obviously stand up and do stuff. Uh, email the Judiciary Committee. If you go on MassGov, I recommend it. Um, now that I, I recommend people too, just getting on these hearings. I, I now do it all. I do it all the time, um, and that's the, the the comment that the about the bills. Um, I'm sorry, but the other person was talking about the the laws that I was laying out. The Title 21. That was actually me because I just um, I don't know if anybody listens to David, Dr. David Martin. He, he does have a lot of really good data about about the laws that are being broken. So um, so S1122. Also, the one that the S two five one six is the one Rebecca Rausch is trying to make it a law to put the masks on kids. So please write in to these. If you go on the on the mask up website, it's very easy to find. Um, if you look at the different bills, but I have some. I'm going to try to post it to the website. Uh, the other bill that was in the hearing on Tuesday is S seven o six. Uh, Rep. Soder presented that, and that is to protect all exemptions. So everybody here, you should send an email to your rep, send it to the Judiciary Committee. Um, we're gonna, you know, S-706 is with the, uh, the Joint Committee on Education. These are all things that everybody can do. And call and email and stand up, because if they don't hear from us, they're not going to. We want that S-112 to go to the floor, because if that bill goes to the floor, they can't mandate anything. So that ends it. And you know you don't, they don't want to put it on the floor, but they will have to if everybody stands up. 
So, thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and Two Health Rights Mass for um, taking this on. This is a huge challenge, and we really appreciate it. We've been at the forefront of all of this. Um, and so we, I do want to say that it's so important for you, if you can, or if you know anybody that wants to run for school committee or board of health in your town, if you need help, if you know anyone that needs help, I'll help you. I need help. We have a team here that will help you. We will do standouts. I'll help you with your Facebook page, who to talk to, who to contact, anything you need. I'm here, Wendy Happel. Look me up on Facebook. Um, so our next speaker, I uh, just want to introduce her, um, is Rayla Campbell. Rayla is a reporter and a host of her own talk show at WSMN in Nashua. Uh, she served as chairwoman for Black Voices for Trump in Massachusetts and was a Republican yes. delegate in 2020. Thank you for doing that. Rayla believes passionately in civil rights. She believes in reaching across party lines for the common good, regardless of a political affiliation. Rayla stands with the military, police, fire, emergency responders, first responders, veterans, and all of those who stood their ground to sacrifice for others. She is a devoted Catholic, mom, wife, and she is running for Secretary of State of Massachusetts to restore faith in the American Republic and the rule of law. Thank you for coming, Rayla. <laughs> Wendy's awesome. Good evening, Abington and surrounding towns. We didn't hear you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rayla Campbell, and I am running for Secretary of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As you've probably seen, my three kids running around. Don't mind the break dancer. You'll be all right. I am so blessed and honored to be here with all of you. Yesterday, we had an amazing rally in Boston. It was incredible. Lots of people were here, and we marched through the city of Boston and shut down Hanover Street. It was really incredible. It rained on us, but you know what? There was 1,200 people there. Thank you. Marching through the streets this is what we must do. And as your next Madam Secretary, the keeper of information, we've had so many people, Sam, amazing, who have come up and told you what you can do. Why is it that the Secretary of State the Prince of Darkness, <laughs> wants to keep that information away from you. They're secrets. They're hiding. Follow the money. When I become your next Secretary of State, this information will be free and available to you, the people, as it should be. We are Bostonians. This is Massachusetts, where liberty and freedom were born. Where we have fought for our rights, for civil rights. The first African-American, all African-American regiment was where? The 54th, here in Boston. We have fought for our liberties. When you think about the Tea Party, taxation without representation. When you take history out of schools, guess what it does? It repeats itself. It is time for us patriots to stand up against these tyrannists that are in office against the devil himself who is not allowing us to be on the ballot because they want one party control in this state. But fear not, my friends. 
because now he's got a challenger. So Bill Galvin cannot go out there and do a single thing when it comes to our elections because he is now a candidate. And that is a violation of ethics. Welcome to the campaign, Galvin. I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. They broke the law against me. They violated my constitutional rights. They wanted to silence our voices. Me, born, raised, that's crazy, don't mind me. He's not good. Born and raised here. I've never seen people for skin color. I have only grown up seeing red, white, and blue. This is what we need to fight for. We need to not be afraid. Jesus tells us to not be afraid. Jesus heals the sick. Jesus tells you to show you his face. Why are you covering your face? Why are you doing that? Jesus will bring the light. And we have to have faith in the Lord. And faith that you have strong candidates that will stand up and that will protect your rights and that will make sure that our elections are free and fair, and that we are counting the ballots, we are voting on paper, and they are hand counted. Yes. One day of voting. It is election day, not election month. We've all been sucked inside of our little houses and trapped away from the world. Two weeks to stop the spread. <laughs> Two years later, and they want to trick you with everything that they're doing. My children are mixed. They're Irish. <laughs> so yeah, Irish and black. Which one's more oppressed? They don't want to teach our kids that. They don't want the truth to be out there. So when you bring critical race theory into my kid's life, you got another thing coming. I ripped my kids out of public school because my daughter came home five years old. She's nine now. And she said, Mommy, guess what? I learned about Martin Luther King. And I said, oh, I'm so excited. What you want to be? I'm so excited to hear what you want. Thinking I had a dream speech. She said, Mommy, I learned he was killed by a white man. Oh. My jaw dropped. I was on the phone, on email. I had a meeting the next day with the superintendent and the principal and the teachers of that public elementary school. And I went them something that they've never seen before. Because I was not going to allow them to teach my baby racism when Martin Luther King was a Republican <laughs> and he stood up for freedom, for what we cherish dearly. And if we don't fight for our freedoms, we're going to lose it. We can see it happening every single day. Now, I have a radio show that I speak on, and it is national. You can get me on any platform. You can get me on my platform. You can get me on Alexa. You can get me through the website. It's WSMN in Nashua. Every Thursday morning from 9 to 11, we are feeding you the truth. What they don't want to hear. And they look at me like, oh, she's not saying what we want to say. She's not going with the narrative that we want her to go with. Black voices for Trump. They call me the black female version of Donald Trump. 
<laughs> He's a New York and I'm a Bostonian with different sports, but we're hard asses. <laughs> and I fight for what I believe in. I'm a mass whore and proud of it. <laughs> strong patriot and there's no way in hell you're gonna tell me that my husband is a white supremacist and that he's racist when excuse me if history serves me right Irish were enslaved to the 1950s you're gonna teach that to our children absolutely not because they want to go back to the labels. Colored people, oh, oh, now it's people of color. Same thing. The Democrats are the party of racism. They always have been. We need to stop it. We need to get strong patriots that are going to stand up there. I am probably not vaccinated. And my children are in. I am not getting it. You are not going to force it on my children. I have hugged over a million people. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. And I'm this is what they don't want you to hear. Truth, facts, and honesty. I will bring you truth. That's the job that I am going to be taking over. Yes. Information. How many FOIA requests are in the Secretary of State's office? I got one. I'm still waiting. Freedom of Information Act. This is where you need to get the information. And when you bring it to the Secretary of State, he should be following up on that. No, you get the runaround, you get the runaround, you get the runaround. Why is he hiding information? Because he doesn't want the people to know their rights. And I will make sure that you know your rights, that there are constitutions in every single public library, that our statues are put back up, that our public buildings do not hold any political flags outside. And we have seen it. The American flag, and just below it, the Massachusetts state flag. That's what's up there. Our children need to learn civics. They need to understand the laws of this country. They need not to be indoctrinated to pit each other against each other. My children are beautiful. You've seen them running around. Beautiful curls. I'm so jealous. It's fantastic. I mean, she doesn't even have to use the fake Irish thing when she does that. I mean, she's right there. But these are our children. We are the melting pot. We have already done this. We are mixed of all different backgrounds. It is not a race, because the race is a human race. We are of diverse backgrounds. And if we are not waking up to what they're doing, you're going to lose every single freedom that you have. And I am out there on the front lines, no matter where it is, and I'm fighting for you. Because it is we, the people, that need to stand up. And it is we, the people, that our Constitution protects when our government becomes tyranny, tyranny and terrorist and communist and socialist. America is not a communist country, and it never will be. We are born free, and we are given these liberties by God. Nobody else. 
And we need to be making sure that you are keeping God in your children's life. And you are understanding how important it is. Because right now, it is a spiritual battle. It is good versus evil. And the devil is right there in front of you. 